So I'm here with Martin and Sarah from Hilltown Organic that I found about you folks was at the farmer's market in Exeter and you were selling wild edible plants but you run a polycultural growing system for your farms and you incorporate wild edible plants in the growing system so yeah just take it from there really just tell us about delightful farm yeah okay so well, we're just here looking at uh, a couple of beds um, and I'll just point out what we've got growing. We've had broad beans growing in this bed. We've got the red Russian kale, some Croyan mint. We've had dill, lettuces, but also what you can see are there's plantain there, there's nipplewort there, there's sorrel, there are nettles just around well, the edge. Angelica is that? That's mm -hmm. wild yeah. angelica. Um, and dandelion. So many of these sort of Plants are seen as weeds to the gardener or the farmer, uh, and a lot of time is spent rogue weeding these out, hoeing them. But they're really important, as well as edible foods, they tend to be important system plants as well. They're accumulating minerals. They're, 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 they contain a lot of the trace minerals that have been missing in a lot of our modern um, vegetables. Uh, because of industrial farming practices and um, so these plants are quite important um, and, it, and they grow abundantly if you allow them to um, so you can see that we've got some really healthy plantain yeah. there and a bit of sorrel nice. lovely lemon yeah. sorrel which we add little bits of to our, to our sort of hilltown organic salad mix and um, you know, they, we planted this bed, we're now in September, we planted this bed up in in April and um, we've had the let we've harvested the lettuces, they've, they've been and gone, some of them are in flower. Mm -hmm. And um, we, when we plant our beds, we mulch everything, we keep the soil covered on everything. We are you no dig? We are completely no dig. Okay. And have been from the day we arrived. And, um, and that, over time, with our difficult heavy soil and the, the action of soil biology, we've built a really deep layer of um, really friable, fertile soil, which um, you know, is, the, the plants respond to that and have this sort of relationship with the soil biology. You know, they're photosynthesizing and exuding um, a percentage of sugars down into the soil to attract all those beneficial microbes that uh, help mobilize all those nutrients we've got in our soils. So yeah. would, would a traditional organic farmer, because I mean everyone, I mean one of the things as I was talking to you earlier about is that you know organic people immediately think oh just because it's organic it therefore is is beneficial to the to the soil and yet we were talking, or well, you were talking yeah. about how some some of the bigger kind of organic establishments are, are actually wrecking the soil. Um, yep, so they're, they're obviously having to lay up their, their damaged soil for a number of years to rebuild soil fertility. Um, and you know, the, the more and more that soil is disturbed, ploughed, rotivated, bed formed, you're losing a lot of soil biology, you're losing fungi, which is really important. Um, you're, you're releasing carbon back into the, the atmosphere, or we know what chaos that is causing. Yeah. Um, so the more and more and more that you do the cultivating, the more damage uh, we do to the soil. And uh, but at least organic, they're not having the chemicals applied. That's sure. That's the important thing, which differs from you know the, the chemical applications. So uh, and that's where the customers are assured that you know the organic hasn't been contaminated with any any artificial chemicals. One of the things I was a bit kind of shocked by, I suppose, really, is that you have soil association certification, but to get that you had to to um, have a bit of a discussion with them because of, of the seed gathering, which to me is a fundamental, like, every culture saves its seeds. Yeah, it's just, that's why the problem with Monsanto and all that is that the farmers in India no longer 
save their seeds and use use terminator seeds. Mm. Um, so they've obviously came round to to understand that. But what what's the problem with saving seeds, even if you're an organic farmer? Why 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 would um, would they look at look, well, frown on the, that? They're just grey areas at the moment. So we're using our own seed. We're, we're crossing a lot of our plants. And um, so under organic standards, we're obliged to use seed, which has the, the same organic certification. Right. And rightly so. So we have to declare on the inspection uh, the source of that seed. Um, and they have to take our word for it that you know we're producing our own seed, um, but visually they can see that we're doing that. Yeah. And they have to record it. There are lots and lots of paperwork that we have to do to prove that we're not using non-organic seed and prove that we're not using chemicals. Whereas conventionally, of course, there's no paperwork of such having to be done. Yeah. So with the the world edibles when did when did that kind of come on your radar because you do bags of certain world edible plants um i'm just interested in the journey of because for me as a forager you know i'm not interested in being a romantic going back Mm. to some supposed ideal that never actually existed um purely in our heads but taking farming and growing forwards and recognizing that you know the wild edible plants really do have a place within traditional or conventional farming systems. Um, how did that all come about? Just um, well, I've had a long passion, I've been sort of uh, interested in wildlife since a boy. But of course, in those days, I wasn't aware of the food values of these plants. Uh, I went. To through agriculture college, learnt farming conventionally, but I still had this, you know, I, I could identify all those arable weeds and um, and they, they attract so many of, of our sort of interesting in- insects and, and wildlife. Um, you can see on, on the flowers in front of us, we've got hoverflies yeah. and lots of bees and there's just spiders teeming everywhere. So all these these other plants in our polyculture are adding to biodiversity. And it's, uh, yes, I've developed more of um, an interest in in the um, these plants that we've got growing around us: dandelion, plantain, mallow, nettles. And you find that they've got more nutritional value than a lot of our cultivated vegetables. Um, and they grow happily amongst the crops. Um, we do sort of, you know, control, we watch the, the nettles. We don't want them growing rampantly and um, just knocking out, o- over competing with our other crops that we've got growing in here. So they, they're allocated their space and um, they happily coexist together. So, um, over over the years, you know, Sarah and I, we've um, learnt a lot from other wild foragers and herbalists, and through reading, through generally observing as well. Um, you know, they, they, it tends to be that actually, you know, we we mulch our beds, and what grows through tend to be really useful plants, and we're not having to weed or hoe too much in fact um, and well we haven't hoed a bed in in the eight years we've been here wow so it's just a little bit of pulling and dropping the weeds as we see the need to and um, that's the result you get a lot of food per square meter i mean as someone who, who went through agricultural college is it is Polycultural growing systems, is it, it easy, is, it, is a, you know, a bit of a subjective word, but is it easier than conventional growing practices? Oh, it's quite complex. It is complex, okay. but once you sort of get in tune with it all, 
it, it kind of you, you, your instincts return as a human. That reveals itself. To yeah, you. it's yeah. just that. It's very difficult to explain, but yeah, um, it's so easy to go out there and drill as I used to do in in my previous job job as row crops, drill a whole bed of um, leeks or brassica. You have one crop to to keep an eye on. You rogue hoe weed everything else. Yeah. Here you need to have an understanding of each plant and learn that um, and learn the relationship between its neighbour and what what it maybe has a negative effect on. Um, so it's all been a learning experience. Uh, quite late on in life actually. You know, I didn't, we didn't have to take on this land until I was in my 40s and uh, uh, up till my sort of mid mid thirties, you know, I was um, I had conventional farming ingrained in me. Um, you know, all the most of the gardening books tell you um, to to apply um, you know the nutrients that grow the crops. Um, yeah. The N the NPK uh, and the fungicides to apply to plants affected by uh, uh, fungal diseases and so on. Um, so that has been a learning curve and really it, it all came to a head when I was very fortunate to land a job um, in Exeter at Chillingford Organics growing veg is a job but it just happened to be an organic farm. Right. And then yeah. And that was your Damascus moment. It was indeed. <laughs> Everything made total sense. I was looking at these crops where Mr. Bragg hasn't applied any chemicals whatsoever and um, all the pennies dropped. Yeah. You know, and you look a little bit deeper and you start reading the organic books. Um, yeah. And so there's no need to put on these chemicals, the artificial fertilizers. The nutrients are all there. We just need the soil life to mobilize all those nutrients. So we've got, so the, our air is 70% nitrogen. Yeah. We need the plants to, to get that nitrogen out of the air uh, into the soil. And uh, so, yeah. And then the wild is just part of the ecosystem that helps all that happen. Yes, so I uh, deep belief that the more diversity of anything um, the healthier um, crops people are um, and it's just uh, uh, growing a combination of plants results in higher biomass yield and um, biomass yield being so crop yield yeah yeah grows more stuff and also it attracts all the different bugs the microbes and you have all the different minerals as well. So, a lot of them, wild plants are also perennials. So, you know, a lot of them have much deeper roots than all cultivated veg will do. So, so we are using the whole kind of a structure of the soil, plants that go much deeper with the roots, others that, you know, spread um, maybe more superficially. But, um, so they are, and, we do obviously we do use them in the like in the salad bags in in the other wild packs that we do but they got that they got that function and also they are there to help the other cultivated plants because they they bring up all these nutrients and even when there are maybe too many and we want to you know they might be like goes into much shade or something we might pull them yeah. we, we drop them we let them there so that they will decompose and whatever minerals they have accumulated they go back into the soil so they cycle into the hole um, so they 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 go and then there is the whole obviously um, um, benefit that Martin was talking about in relation to insects and you know how they how they the, the different relationships that they might build with the with the uh, soil biology that maybe the cultivated plants don't so there is a whole it's a whole you know it says there's so many the aspects whole system, isn't yeah it? it's a whole system and they and then they are also they are the plants that naturally come up here so 
they grow, they just, you know, they are the ones, the kelps, and so we, we're planting in, but these ones are popping up of their own accord. So they clearly have a very good relationship with their soil. They, they are the ones that come and recover the soil. So um, it makes sense that they are there. We can use them to our advantage in more than one way. So it's a win-win. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I remember um, Frank Kirk, who was my plant mentor and got me, got me out pontificating about wild plants <laughs> all the time. Um, you know, he was very adamant that where wild, specifically where wild plants grow within human culture, that we need to pay attention to them because they're telling us something. And, and they're often with language, you know, people kind of, they, even our, our language and vocabulary still excludes the human from the ecosystem. And yet, everything talks with it to me, and I put it in quite simplistic terms, you know, everything in an ecosystem is talking to everything else. And we are part of that ecosystem. So if plantain suddenly pops up, what's, what's the chat going on about? Mm. And have we, can we hear it? And you were saying that, you know, just by sitting with the land, and I liked what you said about observation. Mm. And, and I'm quite old school in the sense that I love the old Taoists. Mm. And that's exactly their philosophy, is to sit and observe that's what farming is, is observing. And uh, we've forgotten that as, uh, as an industry. Um, it's just become so easy to jump on a tractor and you can't get what's going on in the soil sat in a tractor seat. You know, to get off it sometimes and, and have a look at that soil um, and just take, take to get a spade and just take a sample and have a look at it and, and um, you can really see what's going on and how the, all that soil life is aggregating soil and, and, and that life in that soil is, is, is releasing glues and all these different enzymes and, um, and, and sticking little particles of soil together uh, and building structure so that the our water can permeate into the ground better and our it, the air can get into the ground. Uh, that's what our soil really needs is, uh, is good structure and um, and that can help um, with uh, heavy rain um, events, you know, it can, can just sort of slow down things like flooding events. So it has far, you know, other um, Unintended consequences. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah, important to us. And um, the other important aspect is, you know, putting the maximum nutrition into to the, the vegetables as well. Uh, we want the veg to be at to nutritionally um, just at their maximum. Yeah. With the whole range of nutrients. And they build uh, resistance to disease and pest attacks as a result. You know, they, uh, the Brussels sprouts that we can see here, um, they haven't had hardly any cabbage white attack this year at all. Uh, we do get slugs. Slugs are, uh, they can be a bit of a nuisance, but again, they're part of that food web. Yeah. And um, if everything's in balance, and uh, they do not enough damage to worry about them. Yeah. So, so the food web is, is something I'm curious about. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, so um, in fact, it's, there's only now in, in the 2000s are we really realizing um, the importance of, of our microbes in our soil, but also on our bodies, in, in our gut. Um, uh, and it's only now that we've really got those tools and the, the high magnification lenses to look at these microbes in more detail. Um, and we're learning about the, the, their association with the plants um, and the other microbes that depend on, on the simple bacteria. Uh, and they all have a role to play in that soil food web. And if we knock out part of that food web, it kind of all goes out of balance, all out of sync. So 
one thing that damages um, uh, soil biology is soil cultivation. Um, there's, we have um, in sort of soil, we have our bacteria and our fungi, um, which are both important, important in balance, but fungi um, is very sensitive to soil disturbance and it takes much, much longer for fungi to recover, to grow, um, whereas bacteria multiply extraordinarily uh, rapidly. Um, and um, so we want things like bacteria and fungi in balance. They themselves um, don't release nutrients. Yep. They're locked up. Yeah. So we want something else to come along and and eat those um, microbes, the, the fungi that, are, that we can't see with our naked eye. And um, in, in a, so actually, just to put it in quantities, in a teaspoon of good healthy soil, you've got a billion microbes. Wow. That's an extraordinary number wow. of microbes. Um, and in an area two <laughs> meters by two meters, Fungi, if you were to unravel all that, all the sort of complexity, isn't it? The the um, the fine white um, roots of the fungi, they'll they'll they can go right around the, the circumference of the globe. And it's just huge. In how long? Two, two by two meters square wow. ground. Wow. And um, so there are a lot of nutrients bound up in in that. Um, biology in those microbes. We want something else to come along and feed on them. So that's where the protozoa come in. There's the nematodes, there's the micro arthropods, all those insects and mites, still microscopic. Yeah, uh, we can't see those with our naked eye. Um, and of course, uh, what we're all familiar with, the earthworm comes along, and they it eat, eats soil and it eats those microbes and um, breaks them down, digests them into their blood. Um, all that activity has, has this waste product. Yeah. And oh, it's pooping out all this stuff. And that's the um, mineral rich uh, nutrients that then become solubly available to the plants. Or in the case of certain fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, they have a two-way relationship where the plants, uh, the, the, so the mycorrhizal fungi have, uh, they're connected, they're inserted into the plant root cells. Mm -hmm. And so the plant is feeding that fungi sugars in return. The fungi is giving back um, all sorts of um, mineral com compounds and trace elements and phytochemicals to help you know, help plants um, resist pest attack and yeah. so on. And then it's the, the cultivation that does the harm. Yeah. So, you know, this is why um, uh, we, the, the whole market garden is, is under no dig practice. And how, I mean, that is, it, I'm just, it's mind boggling to me and I'm just trying to get my brain around it as I'm sure many of the listeners are kind of like, wow, this is so, it, it has so many, um, so much implication to our future as humans and our relationship within an ecosystem. But I, I can just hear people in the back, yes, but this isn't practical. You can't feed 65 million people in Britain in this growing system. What would be your answer to that? Okay. Um, so just to say, to start with, there are farms in this country, thousands of acres big, and farms in, in America, 6,000 acres big, doing no-till, there we go, <laughs> pheasant in the background, <laughs> doing their no-dig, um, no-till method. And they're scaling this up by, with this new knowledge that we've got of microbes, they can take from a healthy, 
patch of soil where the leaves are really glossy and vibrant, no pest attack. Now you can take a sample of that soil and take it away, pop it in some water, stir it up, suspend those microbes and then grow it. So they can bubble it away and feed it some molasses and multiply these beneficial microbes. And instead of using their spray booms, spraying pesticides, they're now using it to spray this compost tea. Wow. And so they're applying microbes that might be missing from the soil. And also they they're, tend to be more a mixed farm rather than monocult monoculture farms. They're growing a range of crops and they may have livestock um, as well in, in that system. Um, and the, the, the knowledge and the examples are out there um, to prove that we don't need chemicals really. And the chemicals what are what kill these soil biology, they drive away the beneficial bugs and beetles in particular are so sensitive, sensitive to those chemicals and those chemicals remain present in the soil for a long time uh, and, and it keeps away a lot of beneficial creatures but over time you know there are bacteria and fungi which uh, detoxify that soil so you know the soil can recover using the knowledge that we have with microbes now and um, yeah obviously scale is our is what allows us to do that here we do everything by hand we don't have a plow we don't have a rotivator um, and you're how big how big's your your well the growing side of it um, with our sort of polyculture beds and agroforestry strips of trees throughout it's 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 around uh, it's around four acres so we have a meadow as well where we we make hay which is a resource to to mulch mulch the soil we keep the soil covered at all times and I would prefer to use compost but there's never enough compost sure um, to to cover the area that we manage so hay is um, next best thing or or, or Chipped wood chip is good. It's slightly decomposed. Don't find that acidifies the. the uh, it shouldn't soil. do. No. Oh, okay. No. 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 Uh, and again, sort of going back to what I was saying about plants, given the conditions, create their own pH conditions. Yeah. Um, and our land is tested five to five point two uh, pH, which uh, means to people who don't know about so, growing. So. Um, Generally, uh, most of our cultivated food crops grow in soil with a pH of 6.5 to 7. Right. And anything below or above that, um, the plants either won't grow or, or just don't look healthy. They, they require uh, a certain pH in the soil. And given the biology, you know, those plants are sending down sugars to the roots uh, and attracting all that life uh, and, it, and that and all those bacteria and what life just surround those roots um, creating the, the pH conditions that they're happy with uh, so we don't apply artificial lime yeah uh, um, just personally I see that as a soil amendment I mean that this all all the nutrients are available in all the world's soil, all across the globe. On deserts, um, we just have to apply soil biology mm -hmm. and uh, we can, yeah, grow all this food. Amazing, amazing. And how has, because you, you supply some of the, 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 well, I found out about you from the local farmer's market, so you sell wild weeds to the public how do they respond well uh the term weed is <laughs> is given to a plant growing in the wrong place yeah i know um for me uh, we see a value in all of these crops 
Um, you know, even docks have a place, you know, if there's a dock growing and not causing a problem, it will remain. We just pick the leaves and drop them. Um, so, you know, the plantain that grows readily here, the, 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 the wild sorrel grows readily here. Um, they're allowed to grow amongst our, our main crop and they self-seed. Uh, as do our vegetables. The, yeah. th the vegetables also complete their life cycle, um, and so they're they're dropping their seed because we're using open pollinated seed, um, where the next generation of that crop comes true. We're not using hybrids. Right. And uh, so that then means that we're building a seed bank in our soil, which is not just the the weeds, as you called it, but also, you know, the kale, the spinach, some lettuce, um, mustards are coming up as weeds, yeah. essentially. Great. So, you know, yeah. these, these are... You're making your monocrops feral. <laughs> these are tall um, flowering plants here. Well, these are lettuces here, which yeah. um, we've, we've taken all the salad leaf off from as a young plant. They've just grown up through. Um, and then now um, providing food for all the pollinators and uh, other insects. They're growing happily alongside uh, Pentland brick kale and, and chard. And in there also we've got mustard and rocket going to seed. We've got yeah. leeks going to seed, spinach going to seed. So we're at the end of the season now where a lot of the, our vegetables have completed their life cycle but we're still picking other crops in that bed. And we're picking the kale, we're, we're foraging um, for uh, you know, the, the, the sorrel, the plantain, the nettle, and so on. So um, that, that type of, it, it's not pretty to look at in the sense it's not row crop, it's not sure. neat, it's yeah. they're not looking the same. To me, that, that's more attractive because I've got butterflies flying amongst it. It's, it's uh, all the bees and hoverflies there. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and it's also our green manure for the next crop. So this will be all trampled down and mulched with hay and then the next crop will be planted through it. So we don't have to rest our land to build fertility. It's doing it all the time. And each and every year, the soil becomes more and more fertile. The crop rotation's out. Yeah, the <laughs> the, the standard crop rotation is it's not done here. We grow a legume in every single bed. Mm -hmm. And we know that legumes fix nitrogen. Mm -hmm. There are also free living bacteria in the soil that fix nitrogen as well. That's where we, we get that from. Um, we grow beets, brassicas, in this bed we've got this red Russian kale growing, we've got onions growing, we've got lettuces, mustards, um, uh, and fennel, dill, some carrots, you know, they all happily coexist together. And amongst that we plant flowers as well, the sunflowers, the calendulas, the nasturtiums. Um, and other interesting plants like vegetable mallow and ochre yeah. root there. We even let the, the wild oats. wild oats grow. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they just don't interfere with the other crops around them, um, adding to that diversity again. We've got a verbascum growing there, yeah. a million. Yeah. Um, and it's just an interesting landscape to look at. It's extraordinary, Martin. Really extraordinary. I, I get really jazzed up when I meet people like you who are, who are I mean, it's pioneering stuff. As you say, it, soil biology, this is really, as you said, only come in in the 20th century, yeah. 21st century. 21st, rather. yes. Um, and the future is optimistic and hopeful. Uh, yes, I think so. And it's being applied to big acres, big areas of land now, and you've still got 
The, the chemical companies are still doing their thing with their propaganda, saying that we need GM here. We, you know, it, and it's just all so false. Um, and it, it just will do so much harm to our environment and um, and our, you know, it, GM has been tested on, on human safety and there's all these claims that it is safe and has been tested, fully tested safe, yeah. but it's all false. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't been enough time for a start. No, we're guinea pigs. Yeah. You know, that's what has... And, and there's, this, there's, there's this pattern of this rise in all of our really horrible chronic diseases that we've got now uh, at around the time where all these chemicals were starting to be used, and it's, it's no coincidence. Uh, and there's the independent research now, you know, proving that. Um, so, yeah. yeah, there's a war in heaven, as they say. I remember I had, um, I had, uh, I, I was taking a load of TED conference okay. attendees. I mean, TED, TED, not TEDx yeah, yeah. people in Edinburgh. And I was at the kind of sitting down, having the meal after the, after I'd done my bit and the chef was, had got in and doing his. And I sat with George Soros's right hand man. Now, regardless of what you may think of George Soros, I said to, um, I said to this guy, I brought up Monsanto and his eyes, and he's Russian, right? He's a Georgian. And his eyes just went ice cold. Mm. And he leaned forward and he looked me in the eye and he said, we've had Monsanto and people like Monsanto before. And he leaned forward and he whispered to me and he said, and we have a phrase for that, never again. And Soros is Jewish. Mm, okay. And never again means we will never have fascists again. We will not allow it. And he was, I mean, it was, it was, it put a chill through my bones because here you have a billionaire who is basically at odds okay. with other billionaires. Mm. And yeah. so I describe it as there's a war in heaven, uh, you know, at the yeah, top yeah, of that yeah. kind of heart patriarchal mm -hmm. hierarchy. Um, there's a there's a fight going down. Mm. Mm. Okay. And only time will tell mm. how it pans out. Yeah. But, you know, anyone that is doing anything to counter the the horror of monoculturalism yeah. is a hero. Um, I mean, I have to say that, again, going back to scale has been key for us. And it goes back to we just need more small farms, and the farms have got too big. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, and all, you know, the bigger you get, the generally, the more compromises are, are made. But, you know, it, it's, it's proving now that the, the tools are there to turn it around and use the knowledge that we're gaining, uh, moving forward progressively, um, certainly not going back to um, the old ways, um, to producing more food per square meter in, in using these methods and not needing any of these um, modified, genetically modified crops. Yeah. And I'd say a lot more nutritional as well. So um, you might not even need to eat as much <laughs> because when, you, when you're eating food that's dense with nutrients, you know, your body gets nourished yeah. quicker. I mean, I found <laughs> that, I mean, just last night we were, you, you know, I made a dish with mallow and sea aster in it. And, and I, I just, I find all the time, that's why I like foraging is that the nutrient density is so high that I just don't actually need to need eat as much. much. It might not look the case, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, you know, Winnie the Pooh clone here, but yeah. Quite often our salads contain 50, 60 different leaves, mm. herbs, edible flowers. That's amazing. Yeah. It's uh, wonderful to hear. They are, they are, it is, it is a, yeah. It's the main, it's the main um, use of our time and or is, is, is the salads and um, we harvest by, in these beds, going with a, with a big um, bucket and, uh, you know, we're picking one leaf at a time and there's one plantain here and one piece of kale there and one mallow leaf there. Yeah. And, um, 
and yeah, I think that um, reflects on <laughs> but, <laughs> what so, it is. You know, we're putting into that food bag crops that aren't considered. I mean, Brussels sprouts are only mm. eaten at Christmas, yeah. the buttons, and then they're forgotten about. Mm. And you know, we're, we're putting these leaves in our. Um, Put that in the summer. Yeah, it's, exactly. I do into our food like bags. Yeah. Um, right throughout the year, so the the little Brussels sprout tip flower there, or it could be, you you know, you're picking a vegetable mallow. Mm. Um, it could be the Cavallo Nero kale, it could be a nasturtium leaf, mm -hmm. um, a red mustard, and um, you know, those, those all go in, in, in the bag together. The spinach leaves, chard leaves, yeah. Little, small leaves. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and because they're planted as a polyculture all mixed up, it's easy to end up at the end of a row a uh, ready mix of leaves. We've got the red Russian there, you can see the yellow yeah. flowers. Yeah. They're delicious in, in a salad. Um, doing multiple things, they're bringing in beneficial insects, we're adding it to our salads, uh, and they're quite decorative as well. And a lot of um, nutrients are concentrated in, in, in flowers as well, mm -hmm. so there's, there's a lot of uh, benefits to us for eating those flowers so thank you both oh you're welcome for giving us a little moment into your into your web working with the land and with the plants and yeah. for anyone who is inspired to get in touch with martin or sarah there is the links underneath this podcast to be able to do that so thank you both again. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. It's a um, mm -hmm. very exciting project you're doing. <laughs>